Hi guys, welcome back to Building Better Dungeons. I'm Jack. I'm Connor. And this week, by popular demand, we're going to be discussing um, more villains in different colours, specifically combinations of colours. Our previous video just looked at colours individually. Uh, for anyone who missed that or needs a bit of a run-up, uh, Magic the Gathering has a fun little personality test or alignment system. It's, it's like houses from Harry Potter. Don't even. Uh, so, it's like it's a it's a framework. Uh, you know, cards are in different colors, and those impact the cards what they can do mechanically, but also a little bit more importantly for our purposes, they all have an underlying philosophy. So previously, we looked at the colors individually, what a mono blue person would be or what a green person would be. But a lot of the best fun in Magic the Gathering happens when you mix colors. Hmm. So this week we're going to be looking at specifically the allied pair colors. If you look at the back of a Magic the Gathering card, you'll see that the colors are organized in a little pentagon, and the way they're organized is actually very deliberate. The colors that are neighbors, i.e. they share a side of the pentagon, uh, pentagon, those are what are called allies, and those bring out the best in each other. Colors that are opposite each other, i.e. they don't share a side on the pentagon, are enemy colors, and they tend not to work as well together, but it can lead to interesting builds. Specifically though, today, allied colors indeed so uh, the first combination is blue and white now we're not going to go super into any particular blue white instances uh, like factions or characters in the lore uh you know that's just not what we're doing today we're keeping this accessible for everyone who's interested in D, &D. um so blue and white the, the one sentence description of blue is perfection through knowledge Blue wants to be the best it can be, it wants everything to be the best it can be, and it thinks thinking and planning and learning are the best ways to get there. And what about white, Jack? So white is the colour of camaraderie, community, working together, but also kind of rules and laws and structure to society. Hmm. So white can have a bit of a, a, a fast side, well, you know, when, when white is with green, it can get, get a little bit you know, more instinctual than thinky. And blue can have a bit of a dark side. Blue can be very, very vindictive. Blue can be very out on his own and when he's more with black. But blue and white bring out each other's sense of order and structure and community. Hmm. Um, not to say that there isn't a lot of villainy potential in that. Um, the card we have to discuss here is Lavinia, Azorius Renegade. And her card text is a bit oblique if you're not used to Magic the Gathering. But basically what Lavinia says is if you try to do anything unfair, it stops. It doesn't work. If you try to cheat out something big, if you try to like use cards that you know, create an edge case that give you a huge advantage, no. There are rules. And it, life is better for all of us if we follow these ad admittedly very complicated structure of rules. And I'm going to punish you for breaking them. Mm, exactly. So her whole shtick in... From a lore point of view is she's trying to keep the order keep the peace keep the rules keep everyone playing on a level playing field and um i suppose it makes sense in the lore she works for the government basically mm. uh, blue white are very much the colors of government bureaucracy mm, yeah definitely i w would agree with that um so like all the color combinations we're going to be discussing today um we're having a look at the philosophy through a card um, all from the m most recent time we went to a place in magic the gathering that cares a lot about you know, two color combinations. And we're also going to look at a character from popular fiction. So what is the character from popular fiction we're going to be discussing today, Jack? So the character from popular fiction we've decided to talk about is actually Ozymandias from the Watchmen comic book movie thing. Um, and the reason we thought he was very blue-white is he's, you know, he's a villain, he's the bad guy, but he doesn't do it through fury or power, and he doesn't do it for selfish reasons. He thinks something's gonna, something bad's going to happen to the world, and I'm going to have to fix it. And instead of, you know, taking over planet Earth and trying to enforce his will on the people, what he actually does is he invents this really contrived scenario and series of events by sort of um, messing with the, the main characters and, and the politics of the situation so that he can maneuver all the chess pieces into just the perfect place for him to take over the world and assure that humanity can have a bright future going forward. Well, I don't, I don't think he actually... He wasn't doing any world taking over, actually. The really horrifying thing about Osman Deus was that he just... You know, he, he thought about the situation. He knew that America and Russia were going to go to war. And he said, we need humanity to come together. And so in the comic and in the movie, spoilers, by the way, for a 20-year-old intellectual property, um, Ozymandias destroys New York. He kills everyone in New York. Um, in the movie, he frames uh, a superhero called Dr. Manhattan. 
and in the comic book he frames aliens I'm pretty sure mm-hmm. um, but everyone in New York dies or it might just be everyone in Manhattan either way like a lot of people like a huge amount of people just dead mm. and the world can't go to nuclear war all of a sudden everyone has to band together against these existential threats that are like so much bigger than humanity mm. and so I don't think Ozymandias is taking a huge amount of control because if he was after a personal ambition that would actually be him leaning a bit more into black he's you know he, he's got the plans he wants the world to be a, a better place uh, yeah. he's blue but also he's white because he's, he's really motivated by helping everyone out but that means that he's very willing to sacrifice a few for the needs of the many and that's the thing that makes him the villain in the story the characters really don't agree with his methods they're horrified by them mm. a lot of the main characters take it um, as much more of a you know oh every individual should have the right to choose but Ozymandias says no every individual left to their own devices would blow each other up so the comic uh, makes a quite a the comic and the movie it's unclear how sympathetic he's supposed to be you can agree with him or you cannot and that's the kind of the interesting thing about blue-white villains they take a little bit of work behind the DM screen to realize perfectly um, because if then they really aren't coming at it from the usual villainous motivations. They, they have a plan, and they really do think their plan is the best one. Um, so for your players to conflict with it, it kind of has to have uh, a cost, a human element that is getting you know, ruined or is getting uh, the, the short end of the stick. Um, because Unless your players are just straight-up villains. I mean, blue-white's a great <laughs> color combination if your players are the, if you're running an evil campaign. But even in the more generic, uh, or not, I shouldn't say generic, in the more typical D&D that we're all used to, where our players are wonderful heroes, um, a blue white villain is is going to and they're not going to be someone who's pretending to do something for other people's good they really think that what they're doing is, is best um, and they can be right or they can be wrong you know, the, maybe the situation is just that you, the heroes don't agree that the cost is worth it hmm. but regardless the villain has thought it through and decided this is the best course of action hmm. um, so when you're actually running a villain in uh, D&D who's blue and white expect to see a lot of cleric or wizard type creatures uh, creatures, uh, villains, monsters, people, humans, um, but expect to see them as part of some other greater whole. Blue-white villains don't really do so well on their own in a vacuum. They're usually the leaders of great cults or orders or religions, or maybe the head of some school of wizardry and witchcraft, something mm-hmm. like that. Yeah, uh, by themselves, I mean, it, it seems to go against the nature, right? You know, they, they have they're, they're white. They are strong into the whole community and working together mm. side. Although um, white with blue does get a little bit more um, lonesome. Um, but anyway, that, that is uh, blue and white. You know, you know um, there's actually a fun, I, just off the cuff here, um, we've got time. <laughs> um, I think it might be fun to say, imagine you know, your villain is collecting the five um, pieces of, like the, the, the five wings of Kanax, and when they bring them all together, they'll summon an ancient you know, horror, evil thing for their own purposes. So imagine your villain is blue, white, Jack. So your players manage to swipe the last wing, the last magical item he needs for his dastardly plan away from them. What's the villain's immediate reaction if they were coming at the world from a blue-white point of view? So from a blue-white point of view, their immediate reaction isn't going to be fury. It's not going to be rage, it's not going to be revenge. They're not going to try and blow your uh, your heroes up. They're not going to try and overkill. What they're going to do is they're going to try and figure out what's the best way to bring your heroes on side, maybe. They're going to try, maybe convince them of something. They're going to try... Uh, mess with their minds maybe maybe they think look guys you're here you're heroes and all and that's great and you have some opinions about the world but i happen to know that you're wrong so in this moment in time i'm just gonna mind control you and take that wing back <laughs> yeah blue white is very uh righteous and that kind of thing you know mm. uh, often not, not the color who can be easily dissuaded from the point of view that they've rested upon and um, I, I actually think that uh the blue white villain's plan when disrupted either they have a backup plan that they're going to enact Mm. Um, in this instance, it could be aha! I've actually the you know that claw is being traced, and one of my agents will be following you now. Mm-hmm. Or I think the villain who escapes to regroup is is quite blue white. I think blue white can say, "I like knowing all the variables." All of a sudden, there are unknown actors in this equation. I need to get out till I know it's safe. Do some more inf- research, mm. get information gathering, and then strike um, when I've developed my good plan. Blue white is not a very reactive color. You know, got color combination. Blue white's all about planning. Mm-hmm. And that's that's its strength, but it's also its weakness. Um, you know, they don't improvise well, blue white villains. Exactly, but uh, with the blue white villain, don't feel bad about them trying to misty step away at the mm-hmm. at the uh, crux of a battle. All right. Um, so, what is after blue white, Jack? So, blue white. If you follow the colors around on the back of the magic card, you will get to the combination blue black. Uh, God, I hope I'm confident in that. Anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh, the card we chose to discuss blue-black with is... Oh, sorry, we should, we should have a quick, like, in you know, one sentence, 
uh, outline of each. So you know, we already saw blue. Blue is uh, perfection through knowledge, mm-hmm. and black is I don't know. It's one word thing off by heart, but it's basically, selfish. <laughs> yeah, it's um, you know, ambition through like freedom through ambition. It, black doesn't want anyone. Uh, it's a terrified of powerlessness. Black wants to be able to make its own decisions. Black mm-hmm. wants to be safe. Uh, you know, be impotence, not being able to do anything, being restricted and trapped. And I'm, I'm, I'm describing it in a kind of a red way, but basically black wants to have all the power so no one can ever take it away from it. Hmm. Um, and so when they come together, blue and black, uh, it's blue really values information and knowledge. That's blue's primary focus. And so black kind of says, yeah, you know, knowledge is power. Knowledge is powerful. The way to become more powerful so I can get what I want, so I can make sure I'm safe, is to learn a lot. And, make, you know, a lot of powerful forbidden information. You know, I don't care about those taboos. I'll, I'll go to the forbidden section of the library. And also, Blue Black thinks that the most dangerous thing about its enemies are their thoughts and minds. And it's very happy to go in and tinker with that and mm-hmm. take those things away from them. So what is the card we have to look at here, Jack? So the card we have is Unmoored Ego, and it has a lot of complicated text for a newcomer to the game. But the general gist of it is this card reaches into your opponent's deck and grabs one of their options. Strips it from their mind. Not, not even their deck, actually. You know, Also the hand and also the graveyard. Exactly. You literally you name a card and you you go through every th- card that your opponents brought to the table and if they have them they're they're removed from the game they're exiled they're gone hmm. and you literally say this plan this idea you don't get to think it anymore it is you don't even remember it precise and it is absolute and it is very much um, a blue black way of dealing with things in that blue black doesn't want to wait for you to summon your creatures and then have to destroy them that's very complicated blue black would much rather you forget how to summon creatures. <laughs> It's quite surgical, and that's and the th- thing about it is it's also duplicitous. It's sneaky, mm-hmm. and that's the thing. Blue black loves secrets. Blue black thinks that information is power. It hoards it. It loves learning new information, and it doesn't give anything away when it doesn't have to. Um, the villain, the pop culture villain that we've chosen to look at through a blue black lens today is we chose to look at Hal Nine Thousand. Um, you know, very infamous robot. Blue. He's smart. He's cold. He's calculating. He's thinking all the time, and that's important to him. Mm-hmm. It's his central being. It's his reason for 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 existing. But specifically, he gets a bit of a black twist on him when later in the movie, it's discovered that he has some sort of problem with him. He made a mistake or whatever, and he's afraid that someone's going to call him out, that someone's going to shut him down or turn him off or reboot him or something. And that's where his selfishness grows in. His desire for self-preservation. It's actually quite a human thing, uh, but. There's a you know, very famous, not to retrace the movie for you, but there's a very famous scene where there are two humans who realize Hal's made a mistake and they don't like it. And so they go to a place where Hal doesn't have any microphones and they talk to each other about maybe shutting Hal off. And of course they don't know, but Hal, being blue, has you know, thought about this eventuality and he's learned to lip read. And so he watches the people's lips as they speak and he says, well, they're going to try and stop me. And then he doesn't do anything straight away, actually. He, you know, he, he doesn't act rashly. Mm. He bides his time. And then when someone's going on a spacewalk, a routine spacewalk to fix something, Hal closes the door on that person and never lets them back. <laughs> and then casually turns off the life support for all the, for all the remaining um, people in cryosleep. So no, he's ruthless, he's brutal, he doesn't play by any rules, he's not playing fair, but he's doing it out of fear. He's doing it out of fear of powerlessness. Mm. Um, so yeah, that's uh, your villain um, in Blue Black. Often they do well when they're in control. I think... Um, we as DMs often like to make sure our villains are powerful and, and awesome all the way throughout, but that, that often leads us to try and, you know, the instinct is when your players get the better of your villain to pull something, um, out, you know, to invent something off the top of your head that deals with your player's clever solution. And a blue-black villain, they're not terrible at improvising, but they do best when they're in control, they do best when everything's going according to their plan and they're in the dominant position, mm-hmm. and they really do go, like, they can draw a blank when they're on the black spot, they hate it. They're, they're terrified of not winning. Mm-hmm. You know, it's uh, all their plans if they're not coming together. Um, the blue back villain might be really scared. He might show that fear. He might be willing to, to bargain for his life or or trade anything away. You know, he doesn't have the sense of honor. He doesn't really have a sense of pride. Mm-hmm. Um, your blue black villain, they'll they'll do what they need to, to survive. And that might be you know bowing low to the players. Maybe giving your players that nice moment to feel powerful over a, a once powerful villain, mm. but offering him the opportunity to escape so that you can keep him on for a later time because it is maybe sometimes disappointing if you set up a big bad and then your heroes catch them on the back foot halfway through the story and are ready to cut his head off you need to be able to think of some 
my blue black villain has some information some little tidbit this secret about the players is going to get out if if i don't make it back to my headquarters alive by sunset my ra- lackeys are going to spread this rumor about you and that's going to destroy your faith in the kingdom Wait, wait, is that not your faith in the kingdom? Oh, the king's faith in you. you. <laughs> um, no, and also, uh, any sort of mind magic works really well in blue-black. Mm. Um, because it's not, a, it's, not, it's not fair, it's not just, you know. But the, the blue-black villain isn't out there to prove that they're awesome mm. or anything. The blue-black villain is, win at any cost. So he's happy to literally take your player's character sheet off of them and, and run it for a little while. Um, Avalets and mind players both. Um, occupy this interesting space where they're domineering and they're they're tyrannical and also um, when they're actually engaged with the players mind players have that very cheap um, mind blank or the the, the, the cone of stunning mm. where unless your players have quite a high intelligence they're likely to lose their whole next turn and that feels terrible and the blueback person doesn't care that it feels terrible, terrible. <laughs> and then there are abolists who can enslave one person and have them be chopping away at the, the party and that's not much fun for that player but um, blue back often <laughs> blue back villains they don't care about your player's fun they're they're doing the dirtiest cheapest trick to mm. come out ahead um, but yeah so uh, going back to that uh, idea that we had earlier um, if you know you're about to assemble the fifth of the magical item you need and your players suddenly swoop in and manage to take it off of you we, we talked about what would happen if you were a blue white villain but if you're a blue black villain what's your immediate reaction you know like the the bar just swung in on a rope and literally swiped it out of your hands what do you do <laughs> so Blue black is willing to ca- willing to tra- traverse, jump, cross, willing to cross any line. No more than they have to, but literally any line. Your villain is not above using poison. They're not above using pocket sand. <laughs> Anything they have at their disposal, they will use. Even if it's the nastiest trick, the, the grossest trick, not tends to be, um, doesn't tend to be overdoing it. So they're not going to maybe, maybe they won't fireball, but they definitely will grease the floor underneath their players such that you trip and they have an opportunity to grab the mm-hmm. MacGuffin back. Also, I think the blue black, because they love trading in espionage, might find out that like they might have known beforehand. Oh, here are the, I'll do a quick do a quick tabs. I'll keep the, you know I'll get some information on all the adventuring parties around. All oh, right, that that's that adventuring party. They, they could be a thorn in my side. So I'll learn. Oh yes, the, the cleric's mother uh, has gone missing, mm. and uh, oh the the, the the halfling is trying to find the his, the sword of his father. Interesting. And so when the, you know the halfling swings in and grabs the item. You know, the, the, the villain might quite casually, oh, if you take that away, you'll never, ever find that, that family heirloom. I know where it is, and I'll give it to you for a price. I think that's that's a very blue-black way of mm. dealing with the problem. Uh, but again, if the situation gets out of their hand, uh, blue-black's not necessarily the best at improvising, um, and won't, you know, they'll any a, a chance to escape. Uh, for the blue-black villain, survival is paramount. Mm. Um, you know, they're willing to <laughs> leave all of their lackeys behind to, to burn to death, it means the blue black villain gets to escape. Um, I th- all right, I think uh, so. We'll move along. Um, so we'll leave blue behind. Stay on black. What's the next color we pick up, Jack? So picking up along the way, we grab red and throw that alongside black, and we get the color combination commonly known as Rakdos. But this is the color of selfishness and passion. So, oh, so what- we, we didn't say uh, again that one line thing for red. Red likes. <laughs> You're going to have to say those buds. I don't know them. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I will. But like, uh, it's freedom through chaos, right? Um, so, or, or, sorry, I, I'm not sure if freedom through chaos is right. That's, that's not a terrible line. Red doesn't want to be uh, restricted. Um, red likes to be free to make its own decisions. Uh, black, you know, it, it doesn't want to be powerless. But black doesn't necessarily have the same kind of uh, feeling that red does. Red needs to be making its own decisions. Red needs being its own person. Um, red is really individualistic in a way that black isn't necessarily. Black will happily, you know, tie in with blue um, and be a bit more, you know, like follow in with fall in with a structure or follow in with a group. That's what's best. Red doesn't have that same desire uh, to or the same ability to roll into others. You know, red is quick on its feet. Red is passionate. Red is fast. Red is uh, lively. Um, and when red and black come together, they do tend to, to bring out the worst in each other. Sorry, you were saying. Um, no, oh, sorry, my train of thought. Yeah, so. Black and red, you have selfishness, you have passion, and this leads to characters who just kind of, they do things because they can, they, 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 they have these selfish desires and they enact on them because they don't really care about um, other people, you know, it's they, they want to get theirs and sort of screw everyone else past that. Yeah, they're not motivated by a sense of community, they're not coming back to a tradition, they're not trying to be the best version of themselves, they're hedonists, and they're, they're ugly hedonists. They really enjoy inflicting pain on other people, perhaps. 
a lot of your villains um, who are villains for the sake of villainy will fit into this space. Um, I think the card we've chosen to look at really um, accentuates actually the dramatic flair these villains can run mm. can have. When you're running this kind of villain, it can be a lot of fun to ham it up, right? This is a villain. They're evil for the sake of being evil. Um, you know, they'll do what they want because it's fun because they think that's, you know, wh who has the right to stop them? So um, Captive Audience, again, you can read the card text if you are very uh, engaged. But really what a Captive Audience does is you give it to your opponent. You cast it and it goes under their control. And then at the beginning of each of their turns, um, they have to make a decision as to which of the three terrible things is going to happen to them. Mm. And then whichever one they choose, they can't do that one again. And next turn they have to pick a different one. And eventually, um, after three turns, all the options will happen. But the thing about Captive Audience is that it's a spectacle. You know, the black red, um, black red puts it on someone and one person in, in particular has to pick their own poison and watch horrified as they are choosing the the, 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 the way that they're going to die and it's a wonderful spectacle I, you know black mm. this it's uh, black red isn't black blue if black blue has a problem black blue kills the person outright or Surgical. <laughs> yeah they, they, they like make <laughs> they erase the person's very conception of themselves <laughs> they do the exact most efficient thing to, to get the problem out never of the more effort than they have to put in you know, Black Blue will kill someone if it suits them, but they'll also just they'll change, they'll like break into a scheduling office and mess up the timetable. So there's a window for them to do what they need. Whereas Black Red is gonna do the thing that is the most fun for them. Mm. You know, Captive Audience isn't an efficient card, but it appeals to the player who wants to make a splash and you know have a dramatic thing happen. And Black Red is that person. <laughs> the person like a Black Red villain really is engaging with villainy for the love of the game. Mm -hmm. um, what is our pop culture villain? So our pop culture villain for Black Red is actually quite broad in that we've chosen Sith Lords in general from that sort of niche uh, sci-fi film from the it was late 70s, I think it was. I don't think anyone watched it. Yeah, I'm pretty sure yeah. it was called uh, War Stores or something similar. Stair Walls. Uh, <laughs> yes, uh, the Sith Lords, they, they wear black, they have red swords, the color is on uh, fleek. <laughs> Aesthetic <laughs> points. Yes, um, and they, they actually embody um, Black Red to a great degree. Because you know they get power through their emotions, and that's a very black red idea. Mm. They feel hate and they feel anger and they fill themselves up with it, so that they can become more powerful. But then they use that power to fuel the things that make them angry and hateful. You know, it's not like they become angry and they become hateful and they use those um, emotions to fuel their powers so that they can then do good. You know, one <laughs> leads to the other. Mm -hmm. um, it's so the Sith in general and that entire idea of. You, you, fueling my anger for my own to, to make myself more powerful is a really um, black red idea mm. and it's something your black red villain will often do sorcerers and warlocks occupy really well in this space um, as do you know fighters um, anyone who is like barbarians actually I mean we think of barbarians as red green but barbarians really can you know get into a bloodlust kind of space mm. really say you know I am here now I am loving it and that's what's making me powerful not killing for honor not even necessarily killing for justice or righteousness or even vengeance sometimes just killing because you want to kill mm -hmm. so if, uh, if we look at that situation you know you're running a villain and the, the, the fifth item they need has just been swept out of their hand where are they going from there what is it you're, you're DM you say oh gosh I haven't prepared this I didn't expect my players to, to be able to do this um, but because you've thought about your villain's motivations, you know, they're black, red, what are they going to do? So, black, red, very petulant, very determined. This is where we start seeing the nonsense fireballs being thrown out. <laughs> black, red villains are very happy to throw themselves into a fight if they think it's going to be fun, especially if they think they're going to win. They're not, they're not going to sit back in the sidelines and watch their lackeys do a, do a battle for them, unless they're, you know, particularly good performers. <laughs> um, black, red villains are going to get into the fray and they're going to scratch and kick and bite at the um, up at the heroes mm. oftentimes uh, when you're a DM you'll want to outfit your villains with like the spells that your players might not necessarily choose crowd control is very good for villains because your villains are never going to be fighting your players one on one mm. um, but the black red villain might pick up something like crown of madness or um, finger of death something that's going to screw over one person in particular and just fire that off immediately on the first person who really annoys them I think that halfling better hope that they have a couple of tricks up their sleeve because the black red villain is going to toss an unwise amount of hatred at them and them in particular. <laughs> um, anyhow, so sailing on from black red, say goodbye to black, uh, say hello to green. And if you watched our previous video, we know that green is the color that like sort of makes less sense to us. It's very nature focused. It's mm -hmm. very, you know, it likes to reclaim the old, it's conservative. 
Um, it likes, you know, ecology, everyone being a part of an ecosystem, but it also respects, like, you know, you, like the people who are good at the ecosystem, like, you know, it respects the food chain. The people on top should be on top. Mm. Um, the prey should learn to get good at not being eaten. That's their place. Um, so what happens when we get red, who's all about, you know, feeling, thinking, passion. I don't want to be restricted. Um, with green, who's all about, you know, finding your place in a wider ecosystem and enjoying who you are. So that front lines. when red and green come together, you get a very instinct uh, driven villain. Someone who's just on the path to sheer righteous fury because that's what they feel in their heart um and that's that's the right thing that's how that's how the world works you know it's the 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 people at the top survive because they are the strongest and and they made the right decisions and they're they're the ones with enough you know willpower to get them there Mm -hmm. so in red green you see a lot of um you see a lot of barbarians you see a lot of you know fighters to an extent you see a lot of characters who just want to get their rage out of them um, in a very instinctual, natural, um, you know, as almost as if taking deep breath, <laughs> breathing exercises. I actually think that um, that phrasing, get your rage out of them, is uh, as, as humans, as society, we're quite white focused. We, you know, we, we like um, our structure. I think the idea that, you know, these negative, unwise, um, unhelpful emotions are things you've got to purge yourself of. Mm. And like that terminology is actually kind of white. I think a, a red green villain would object to those terms. You know, mm. a red bril- green villain isn't getting the anger out of them you know they're expressing it they're using it as a vehicle to feel their feelings and you know be the person that they are um so red green feels a little weird because it's not really a spellcaster color i guess sorcerers are actually occupied the space well you know mm. they're, they're do, you know doing what what comes naturally to them they're, they're acting on instinct you know mm. that's, a, that's a large part of where their magic comes from um but they're harnessing the fury in their bones <laughs> <laughs> whenever you have uh those kind of mid-level threats like uh, the goblins and the goblin war chief and the band of orcs and the, the leader thereof or like the lizard folk um, mm. all of those I think can really easily be in a red green space where they can even be relatively um, like quote unquote civilized they can have a, quite a structured um, existence but if they're going out and raiding other people because that's the culture they're used to and that feels good for them and that's you know they're, they like expressing their dominance you know they say oh you know you humans and elves you can like, have your wonderful tree groves and you can do some agriculture but uh, we're bigger than you, we're stronger than you, and we're going to come and rage. And that's just the way of things. And uh, we're not going to stop, because boy, does it feel good from our end. Mm. And uh, red-green really opposes, um, on an ideological level, um, the other three-color combinations in an interesting way, actually. So um, red-green, when it looks at blue-white, it says, oh my god, you're imposing so many structures on people, you're imposing all these rules. That sucks, you know, that's not what nature's like. Mm. Um, nature doesn't have, the, the lion doesn't agree not to eat the antelope. Because the ant- you know it's it's a Wednesday and that's not antelope eating day. Nature is is wild. It's unpredictable. You can't. Mm-hmm. It's it's unnatural what you're doing, um, and it doesn't. It hates blue black because blue black is so secretive. Blue black says you know hide your true self, never reveal it to anyone. Always you know play with your cards up your sleeve, mm-hmm. um, and red green's like play with your cards face down on the table. I I can't. You're living your life wrong. You know <laughs> every time you're not being yourself, you think you know your true self, but you only know your true self when you are being your true self. You're living your life wrong and it looks at black red and says oh i, I can kind of get into a little bit of what you're doing actually you're you're, mm. you're, sort, you're sort of fine but um you know you're just too too self self-focused you know like we all live in an ecosystem together red green says so those, those bands of, of mercenaries or, or goblins or orcs mm. um and those can be pretty big scale like you know, can have extra planar entities coming in and raiding like that mm. um for your high level adventuring campaigns and it works just the same and it's interesting to like how do you, how do your players respond to that kind of threat where you know they have to defend um their you know village or they have to defend their their country or their their plane from uh, this big threat and the threats just says well i i feel like i'm bigger and stronger than you i feel like i burned this <laughs> um actually so uh we have we have a card to talk about too we have Oops. a card <laughs> so the card we've uh, chosen for red green is nikki of the old ways a lovely minotaur centaur with a, a, a nice pointy stick and her text says, you can't cast non-creature spells. So she says, there are rules. You know, the world has these rules. Mother Earth, Mother Nature has this way of things. But she also says, when you tap for mana, you get more mana. Because you're following, you're following the rules of the land, the lay of the, the, lay of the world. You're, you're synchronizing with your own primal self. And because of that, the world rewards you back. Mm. It's this nice cycle. I don't think uh, Red Green tend- views it as rules exactly. Mm-hmm. I think I think it often views rules as this artificial thing people make. 
Yeah. You know, um, like Red Green just says, there's a way you're supposed to live your life. Um, you know, so if you have Nikki on the battlefield, you voluntarily give up use some of the tools you could use at your disposal. You're mm -hmm. not being sneaky. You're not using technology. You're not, you know, doing any of these things that Red Green feels are unnatural. You say, I'm gonna do this the way it was meant to be done. I'm gonna follow the old ways. Just good old fair creatures. And if you agree to make that sacrifice, if you agree to say, you know, oh, I'm not gonna use these tools in my arsenal, Nikki rewards you heavily. You become mm. very good at the things Red Green are very good at. Mm. Um, villains in Red Green are not so easy to find in popular culture. Um, but the one we decided to look at is uh, a bit of an anti-hero rather than a villain, uh, San from Princess Mononoke. If you're not familiar, that's a, it's a beautiful film. I definitely think it's my favorite Ghibli film, which is not a, not a unique stance for me to have. <laughs> um, but uh, very simply, Princess Mononoke centers around a conflict between um, humans who are trying to advance and create progress at the expense of sp uh, forest spirits in the nearby woods. Um, and our main character, Akihiko, or, or it doesn't really matter, is you know, trying to straddle that line. Um, but even though San is a human, she's on the spirit side because she was raised by them um, from birth. You know, she, she was adopted by them as an as a orphan baby. And so San is wild and free. She's completely instinctual. She's very red, but she's also very green because she cares about the natural order of the forest intensely. And so she's responding very, very negatively to the human incursion. She leads nightly raids where there is a lot of casualties. Um, she's, she's brutal. She's ferocious. She's a wolf. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of thing that you're, you're... If you have a villain who is responding to a threat against nature, and they're responding angrily, they're responding with force, then that's a, very, that's a space red-green could really occupy very easily. Um, mm -hmm. I think it was your point that you said, Jack, actually, where the, the Fae, if the Fae decide that human industry is going on too much... You know, if the humans are building a city in an important Fae space, mm. the Fae uh, responding violently is a very red-green kind of thing to do. Mm. Yeah, so it's um, red-green is definitely where you see the um, the type of uh, hippie villains. The villains who are like, oh, humanity has developed too much pollution. We must go back to the, the natural ways, tie yourself to a tree or cut people's heads off, you know, whichever you're feeling. Um, and in most indie campaigns, there's not going to be a lot of Pollution. so that's going to seem pretty extreme you know <laughs> like your players who are used to the modern conveniences of indoor plumbing and like satellites in the sky that facilitate wi-fi they're not gonna <laughs> they're gonna find it a bit odd when someone says wheels that's too far <laughs> what's wrong with horse legs <laughs> all right um, said the centaur <laughs> will we leave red behind and say hello to white mm -hmm. um, say, say hello again to white <laughs> uh so green and white so we've heard these one sentences one sentence descriptions before White is all about, you know, um, order and peace through, like, community and structure. And green is all about um, finding your, you know, peace, wisdom through acceptance, knowing who you are and your place in the wider world. And so when they come together, they tend to really focus on their overlap. You know, white slips away from its uh, similarity with blue. It becomes less about information and, like, mm. intense order. And green slips away from red, becomes a little bit less chaotic. When green and white are hanging out and they're being friends, they are all about community. Mm. Exactly. And that's represented quite well by the card that we've chosen to talk about, March of the Multitudes. So what March of the Multitudes does is it creates a bunch of soldiers for you. But its little twist is if you have creatures already, it creates even more soldiers. So it's unity begets unity, strength begets strength. Exactly. Um, and this all sounds quite lovey-dovey, right? I mean, how are you to find... How is that villainous? If your villain is... You know, a, a green-white villain isn't necessarily like Ozymandias. Isn't going to say, oh, I, I alone get to make the decision that these mm. people should die. Like, green and white might, you know, it might be willing to sacrifice some for the few, but it's not, it doesn't quite have the, the central the weird authority structures that blue-white would put up to make sure that that's how that would go down. Um, and you can kind of see, though... Green White's greatest strength is its community. Everyone comes together. Uh, it, it, that's wonderful and it's great, obviously. But that also tends to be its biggest weakness because it views those people as numbers, as members of the community first and as individuals second. And that's the kind of thing you see when you look at March of the Multitudes. Mm. Um, March of the Multitudes creates soldier tokens for you. If you already have creatures, they can tap and help you make soldier tokens. But it doesn't matter what those creatures are. They could be dragons. They could be giants. They could be you know uh, scientists. They could be uh, mothers. They could be fathers. They could be warriors. They could be cats. Hmm. All that matters is that they're there and that they're in the group. Anything that individually could bring to the table is lost. 
So when white pairs with green, white loses a little bit of its structure and especially a lot of its hierarchy. It cares not about your titles, your lands, your dues. It, it's more, are you there? Are you, are you here for the fight? And similarly with green, green cares a lot less about um, power and dominance and inherent strength. It's just, you know, you signed up, you're going to fight. And so the, the pop culture villain uh, we're going to look at is a bit of a deep cut. It's got, had some remix. Uh, it's 1956's Invasion of the Body Snatchers. And it's those body snatchers in particular we're interested in. So, um, quick overview again. That we're, we're kind of giving the Cliff Notes version of a lot of different <laughs> movies and pieces of culture in this. Um, the body snatchers come in. People find themselves uh, not trusting their family. They find themselves, you know, oh, my mother isn't quite acting right. You know, that, that, that's a bit weird. Or... Um, oh, I, I, you know, I've, I've seen like strange uh, people who look just like me on the outskirts of my vision. What's going on? And you know, the, the body snatchers are an alien race who are coming in and replacing the people with pod versions of themselves. Um, and that's like that, that immediately sounds kind of aesthetically quite blue or black. You know, it's like oh, it's very duplicitous. It's in the shadows. Mm. Um, but when one of the pod people, as they're called in the film, uh, <laughs> discusses their motivations with their main character, they say, "Well, I mean." It, it would be better if we were in charge. You people, you're toxic, you're crazy, you're destroying your planet, mm. and you're so cruel to each other all the time. And there's, some people have a lot, and some people don't have a. Uh, uh, some people don't have much. Wouldn't it all be simpler if everyone was just cared about the community and didn't really care about themselves, l gave up their individuality and their humanity, and just li lived like a nice, stressless existence where they didn't really have to think about too much? And that is kind of what the green white utopia purports to look like. You know, it's, oh, everyone's, you're a part of this great big hole. Mm. But, I mean, everyone's part of the great big hole, and the great big hole doesn't have a lot of a lot to say about your individuality. Um, and so it, I mean, that's the kind of villain you can be looking at for Green White. It doesn't have to be so extreme as a literal hive mind. It could be. You, know, you could have, like, um, a bunch of horrors come together, and the horrors are just, you know, they, all, they, they infect and they corrupt. And, and that's, they don't really care if like, you lose the person you were. Mm. As long as you're part of the team, that's what's important to them. But even a bit more toned back, you could have very easily a you know a king or an emperor or like a baron who says, everyone, whatever your job was yesterday, forget about it. I'm going to give you new jobs. Everyone's going to come together. I have, a, I have a plan. You know, we're all going to do the thing that I say here. We're all going to work together. You know, mm -hmm. we're all going to build roads and we're all going to build farms. And uh, if you don't like that plan, I'm willing to back it up with force. And, you know, the, the cobbler might say, but I, I, I'm really good at cobbling. I'm not so good at, like, building bridges. And the, this person says, well, you can learn or you can die. Yeah, you're, you're in my group or you're out. It's actually, it's also not impossible to imagine, um, like, colonizing forces being quite green-white. You know, mm -hmm. they say, oh, you poor savages. You mean you don't have, like, advanced technology yet? Oh, my poor dears. Yes, no, we, we arrived here from beyond the stars. And, uh, all right, well, we're, we're in charge now. We, we can't be having that. And we have a light laissez-faire touch, but uh, you are going to have to follow everything we say, and your individuality is not very important to us. Mm. Um, you know, that's, that's a great villain for your players to be put up against, um, because they're not evil, exactly, but uh, the threat they represent is a real threat to the way of life that your players are used to, or their characters are used to. Um, so railing against that can be quite fun. Um, mm. So in that scenario that we were looking back at, um, where we have the things stolen from the clutch of your villain, um, how does the green-white villain respond to the players messing up their plans at the last minute? So, firstly, the green-white villain is never going to be on their own. They're never going to be caught without an entourage, without their bodyguards, without their henchmen, their lackeys, that kind of stuff. Um, it's going to be very rare you're going to get you know, a, a villain versus six heroes fight. It's usually going to be a lot more fair numbers-wise. Um, so this is a scenario, actually, where green-white, though, connected with, you know druidic magic clerical magic doesn't necessarily rely on its magic all that much it can push into a you know a more combaty space being like you know hey i've i, I was born as a great warrior i'm part of a, a long line of great warriors and these long line of great warriors have all come together to beat you to a pulp with some hard sticks yeah no it's um i mean it's interesting right because green is uh, red is the most reactive color mm. and blue and white are the least um, green is kind of in that middle where green's able to react if it wants to, but definitely white green, what, you know, not the slowest color combination, but you know on the edge there, not really great at adapting exactly. Mm. Um, I think green white's going to have you know it's going to fall back on the first sort of thing that pops to its mind. You know, it's going to say, all right, all of us together, 
Um, mm. so actually, well, uh, before we leave Green Knight behind, one of the interesting things that's really cool about Green Knight, I think, mm-hmm. um, is that you could have a League of Villains be Green Knight very easily. You could have like six uh, evil fighters, or not evil, exactly, six Green Knight villainous fighters. Um, and they're all kind of in a horizontal power structure where no one of them is the most important. Mm. And this gets you around one of the problems that DMs often have of not wanting their villains to die, having a lot of escape tricks. I remember the first time I ran the indie, um, my, my villain had a candle uh, because I knew the, the players were probably going to kill him with fire magic. And the candle was once lit, wait around, and then whoever's touching the candle gets teleported out of there. Ah. And that was, that was the thing that I thought was very cool and very clever. Um, you know, the villain had to like survive around holding the candle or be killed by fire magic. Um, but yeah, the look at my players' faces, they hated you know, the villain escaping at the last moment. Mm. And that was not something that they particularly enjoyed. Uh, but in this time, in, when you have like six or you know, a, a group of villains all equal to each other, they're all a significant threat, and mm. players feel accomplished when they kill them. But it's not the end of the world for you when they're killed. You know, mm. you can you have other villains in the same league that you can be be working with. Uh, that's a nice compromise. Um, but yeah, is there anything else that you want to bring up about Green White? Um, no, I think that covers most of it. Cool. All right. So, man, we shaved a good thirteen minutes off of this one. Um, we hope that you found that a useful exercise. Um, Again, the Colors of Magic are a very interesting alternative to the alignment system, you know? Mm. You, um, I would encourage your players to, to you know, think about it and to maybe actually put some color identities to the player characters they're creating. Mm. Uh, it's something that I always do. I always uh, tend to think of my character as, you know, oh, well, this person's a mono black, and they could lean, you know, red or blue. It all depends on, like, the party and mm. how it shapes out. And it's, it's pretty fun to, to see how that kind of thing evolves. Um, having a framework to think about things is just useful. Mm. Exactly. Um, this will work for villains. It'll work for other NPCs and it'll... societies too. Where you know you mm. can. Um, I often think about societies that I world build in these terms. It, it really is useful. And like the monocolors, our previous video, um, good to think about. But uh, I think that this combination is where stuff gets quite interesting. Mm. Um, but the sharper among you, or those of you who remember forty minutes ago <laughs> in our introduction, uh, that's only five of the possible pairs. That we only discussed the the pairs who are friendly, um, but. Of course, the colors match the gathering. Each one has two friends and two enemies, mm-hmm. and it's those combinations with colors who aren't necessarily friendly. These colors who have a core conflict. Um, those color combinations can be really interesting because I mean, who doesn't love a villain um, with a with a conflict that they have to resolve themselves mm. or uh, an inner contradiction? Who doesn't love the villain to be a hideous hypocrite? Uh, <laughs> so, do join us in about three days when that one comes out. Um, we hope you found this useful. I'm Connor, and I'm Jack. We are building better dungeons.